Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning with First English Baptist Church. I love that, Steve. It's one of my favorite tunes, too. It is well with my soul. I hope it is well with your souls today. It's good to see so many of us here this morning. And uh, welcome to those of you who are listening or watching uh, via YouTube. We have a, a plenty number of people here, given that we have to space around. But um, it's good. It's good to see people visiting and and uh, renewing friendships. It's, it's been a long year, hasn't it? And we keep going, but I'm glad you're here today. Um, today's Communion Sunday, first Sunday of the month, and uh, you who are here should already have, we are using the little individual communion uh, packets, so I'll give you a little instruction. There's a, a very thin cellophane cover on the top, if you pull that back, there's a little wafer underneath. That's the bread. And then the rest of the cover comes off for the juice. Um, if you have a little spillage, uh, I think we have some extras. So, and hopefully I won't make a mistake myself. Those of you who are listening, uh, if you want to join us in communion later, we hope that you will. You might want to secure a uh, cracker or cookie or some bread item and uh, a beverage that you can use for the cup and uh, you can be part of our communion celebration later in the morning. We start with the bowl as a meditative device and of course the prelude and then we move into what we call the breath of life and it's just a focus, a meditation on a single breath and I'll invite you to join me in that in a moment. We think about it as God's breath, God's wind, God's spirit of, of love, of acceptance of forgiveness, of encouragement and hope and strength and patience and vitality. And as you release that breath, imagine letting go of concerns, uh, difficulties, disappointments, um, confusions, whatever might be a burden of you, to you today. Imagine releasing that to God. And then we'll join together in a prayer of invocation and move into the rest of our worship. So... Thank you for joining us, and if you'll exhale a little bit, we'll take this nice deep breath of life together. Thank you, O oh God, for that breath and for every breath that you give us. Thank you for this new day that you have awakened us to, and that we have the strength today of mind and body to be here with our brothers and sisters in faith and friends and family. We ask for your blessing upon our gathering. You have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. And we thank you for that promise. We pray that in this hour, you would surround us with your love and care, your hope, your strength, the spiritual vitality and encouragement that we need as we gather together to hear your word, to meditate on your presence and your, your love upon us. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us in this day. Hear us now in a moment of silent prayer as we all come together to you before the throne of grace. Lord, prepare us to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. 
with thanksgiving will be all living sanctuary for you. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, Pastor Lee had contacted me yesterday morning and told me what his scripture was going to be, and I found a song to match the scripture, and no matter how hard I tried, I could not find the accompaniment music I needed for it. And for whatever reason, I kept coming back to this song. I've done it before. It's called Father, I Thank You. I think despite the trials and tribulations over the past year, I think there are so many things to also be thankful for. Things we need, we take for granted every day. Um, but today, I am most thankful for the fact my sister is here this morning. And she's doing so well. And I thank God for that.
Thank you, Carolyn. You okay? It's okay. She's had some vertigo of late. So, thank you. That was beautiful. Before I forget, uh, the beautiful lilacs are uh, in celebration of Thelma Louthert's birthday. Um, <clears throat> and Thelma loves purple, right? So that's... Um, and would you sing with me? I want to sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Thelma. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <clears throat> you have, well, maybe you do. <laughs> Thelma is a rock in this church. Uh, um, so we are so, we are so blessed to have Thelma with us. And thank you, Thelma. Have a happy birthday. She's supposed to see Becky today, so... Hopefully that happens. Okay, um, speaking of, of Thelma, I've got her note in front, just a reminder, the women's Bible study is starting this Wednesday, correct? Um, uh, May the 5th, 1.30 p.m., and the morning and evening classes or groups are combining for uh, one, one time um, on Wednesdays, and it's going to go for several weeks. There's a book, Truth Filled, uh, with a five to ten minute video. And if you're interested, please let Thelma know. Okay. Today's Communion Sunday. It's the day that we usually receive the Deacon's Fellowship offering, which uh, is a special fund that is separate from the regular church budget. It's uh, a fund that the deacons oversee on behalf of all of us to provide help to people in our congregation in emergency need. And it's been a godsend for many people. So uh, thank you for your generosity. If you brought a gift today for that, um, we'll receive it in the back. We're not receiving offerings the usual way, um, of course. But if you brought one today, please feel free to, to leave it at the back as you leave. And would you bow with me and we'll offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God for God's graciousness to us. Dear Lord, Thank you so much for the ways that you bless our lives. And even in the midst of, of sorrows and hurts and disappointments and confusions, even then we experience your grace and your love in ways we may not have noticed otherwise. Um, thank you for blessing us uh, and for giving us opportunities to share that blessing, wherever it, whatever it may be, with others around us. As we present our offerings to you, we also present ourselves as living offerings, living gifts to your glory and your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're moving into our other prayer time, and I have retrieved the names that people have submitted for prayer um, online, but we'll also ask for any names that you might want to include this morning. So... Today we're praying for Judy, Will, Christine, Gary, Tiffany and family, Dick, Troy, Drew and Mandy, Amber, Hunter, Callista, Jeanette, Linda, Tammy, Nana Joe, Charlie, and Charlie's here this morning. We're so glad you're here, Charlie. <clears throat> and thank you, Christina, for bringing him. Carol, Karen, Joan, Ella and Joe, RJ and Darlene, and Dr. Bob, Kimber, Kashner, Everett, uh, the people of India and Brazil, hard hit with COVID right now, other places as well. Do you have other people you'd like us to pray for this morning? Eileen. Greg and Joe. Linda. Max, yes, Max is doing pretty well too, all things considered. Let's pray for his mom. <laughs> Randy and Jean. Randy and Jean. 
Phil and Marilyn and Mary Battle. Thanks, Suzanne. Others. Hannah. Davon. Phil. Grandmom. Faith. And Hannah. Got it. Char. Ray and Judy. Frank, Jean, and Peg. Dave. Mark, Monty, and Betty. Carolyn. Barb and Grace. Dalton. Mike. Ted and Steve. Amanda. And you. Yes, Carolyn. Mary. Lori. Jean. Marion. Anne. Kathy, Joe, Sue, and Eleanor. Floyd. Scott and Julie. Scott and Julie. Sue. Brenda, Al, Alicia, and Chris. Esther. Paul and Joan. Baby Marty. And Bob. Is anybody? Annie. Travis and Christina. Thank you very much. Would you bow with me and we'll bring these folks and others to the Lord as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this gift of prayer. Thank you that we can pray with others, whether they're here in the room with us or, or elsewhere, even in time, as well as different locations. We thank you for this gift. You know all these people in situations that we have named and come to mind. You know those that are unnamed. We lift each of them to you. In your wisdom and power and grace, you know their needs, their challenges, their situation, the complexity of their life and what today will bring. We pray, O oh God, that each one will experience your power and love and support and, and strength, wisdom, patience, as they persevere through the challenge they face. We pray for those needing physical healing we pray for those needing spiritual healing, mental, emotional strength, for those whose families are disrupted, for those whose lives are disrupted. We pray for those continuing to battle COVID and all who attend to them and whose, whose livelihoods continue to be chaotic and risky because of a uh, disease that is very difficult to manage. We also pray for those others who struggle with disease, with illness, with loneliness, with discouragement, with frustration and confusion. We pray for those working towards completing their education in this year and we, we ask continued strength for teachers and and professors and administrators and all of those staff that are responsible for helping education happen among us. We pray for health centers. We pray for, for residents and staff in nursing homes and care facilities. Those who are vulnerable in these days, we pray for their protection and strength. And we look beyond our own circles to people at a distance. We pray for their healing, for the relief of the suffering that they're experiencing, especially for those who have lost homes or live in fear, those who are victims of violence, um, political instability, um, those who have food insecurity and insecurity of, of health and, and home. We thank you for the blessings that we enjoy here in this country and we pray for those who still need relief from oppression, from injustice and from harm. We thank you Lord for 
your son Jesus, who draws us into one family of faith, who gives us strength and life like the vine energizes the branches. And we pray, O oh God, that you would keep us connected and vital so that we continue to bear fruit that brings glory to you and to the Father. Hear us now, O oh Lord, as we remember together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture gospel lesson for today comes from the Gospel of John, and it's not a long passage. It's part of a much longer teaching that Jesus brings to his disciples. Uh, John places it on the last night, right before Jesus is arrested. Um, and it will be familiar, but I hope that you hear something new here as well. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes clean so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone abides in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, they are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. Amen. For many weeks, Annie and I have been watching a pair of morning doves nesting just outside our kitchen window above the sink. Last year, it was robins in the same place, but this year the doves beat them there and uh, took possession of the old nest. For many days, a morning dove sat on that nest constantly. Sometimes we'd get a glimpse of an egg below. Eventually, two ugly heads peeked out from under her wings, and we continued to watch the two chicks grow larger by the day. Mom and Dad taking turns fetching food and sitting on the nest. Only a few days ago, we would smile, seeing the bulk of the mom. The two chicks so filled up the nest that the mother looked like she was not sitting on top of a nest, but a pile of feathers. And just days ago, these chicks were venturing out of the nest into the thicket of the yew branches that surround it. This past Thursday, we see them beginning to fly between branches and then to other trees nearby. On Friday morning, two days ago, the nest is empty. It has served its purpose. 
the Dove family has left it behind as it should. This little drama of bird life reminds me of our scripture today from John chapter 15. The part about the gardener who prunes the living branches of the vine, the grapevine, so that they will thrive and bear more fruit. One of my professors in college was a vineyard keeper, and I recall him once commenting that pruning the grapevines was of utmost importance because only the pruned branches produce grapes. Otherwise, the water and the nutrients that are supplied by the root are consumed in the growth of the foliage and the stem, and there's none left for fruit. If the gardener wants grapes, she's going to have to prune the branches. Something is lost so that something better is gained. Nests are great for eggs and little chicks, but adult birds cannot thrive and reproduce unless they leave the nest behind, prune it away, so to speak. In this word picture, Jesus draws of the vine and the branches and the gardener who tends both. There are actually two kinds of pruning. One is pruning away of dead branches, branches that once served a purpose while living but have surpassed their, their lifespan. This is how the bird nest connects me to this scripture. The nest is alive and necessary when it is home to eggs and baby birds. But the eggshells break and fall away to release the chick inside, which has outgrown it. Then the nest is the chick's new home, but only for a short time. The maturing bird outgrows the nest. It becomes crowded and confining. Mom and dad stop the nest delivery service of food because it is time for the young birds to learn to fly and find food for themselves. The egg, the nest, both are alive for a season, but their useful lifespan is limited and short. Neither can be home for an adult bird. The analogy to the dead branches of the grapevine isn't perfect, but like the eggshell and the bird nest, the dead branches of the vine no longer help the vitality of the plant. And also they can no longer produce fruit, which is the purpose of a vineyard, after all. The dead branches are cut away, pruned from the vine by the gardener to make room for light to reach the living branches. Perhaps Jesus here is commenting on the fate of Judas Iscariot, who is one of his closest disciples, but who is turned by forces which oppose Jesus. Judas, the branch, stops being fruitful in Christ and in fact turns himself against the vine the vine, Jesus, survives the attack, but the branch, Judas, dies and is cut off as a dead, unfruitful branch. The second kind of pruning is the trimming of living branches to stimulate good growth and fruit production. Without that careful pruning by the gardener, the, the vine grows helter-skelter, all the energy and nutrients are consumed to produce more branches and foliage, but not fruit. To promote fruit production, the branches must be carefully and regularly pruned. There is, le there is loss and there is gain, but the losses now permit the abundance later. Jesus tells his disciples that they are already clean, meaning pruned, because of the word he has spoken to them. In other words, they are ready now to bear fruit, but they can bear fruit only if they stay connected to him. Abide, remain, stay connected with Jesus, just like a great branch must stay connected to the vine in order to produce grapes. 
I am the vine. You disciples are the branches, Jesus says. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. The vine and its branches live to bear fruit. But what is this fruit when Jesus is the vine and we are the branches? It's the next part of Jesus' teaching that we'll study next Sunday that digs deeper into this subject. It suggests that love for one another is the primary fruit of the vine, which is Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Galatians names the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here in John 15, Jesus doesn't give us a list. But he highlights two features of the fruit. First, his fruit glorifies his Father in heaven. And second, his fruit is the sign of his disciples. Another way to grasp this teaching is simply to focus on one thing. Abide in me, Jesus says. And then the good fruit will naturally follow. Of all the Gospels and all the writings of the New Testament, this Gospel we call John, along with the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, emphasize this intimate, abiding relationship between Jesus and each of his disciples. The other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, speak of Jesus as establishing or ushering in the kingdom of God, the rule, the reign of God into the world. But in John, Jesus is not the builder or the founder of a kingdom. He is the animating force, the life force of a renewed community born from above. In John, Jesus doesn't speak much of God's kingdom. Instead, he speaks of himself. I am the light of the world. I am the sheep gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine. I am the bread of life come down from heaven. In John's gospel, salvation is not found by entering a place, but by being attached to a person. Over and over, John's Jesus emphasizes the relationship of the individual disciple to the person of Jesus. That's not to say that being a Christian is only Jesus and me, or that the slogan, Jesus is my personal Savior, captures everything that's important. It doesn't. Even in John, Jesus calls a people, a group, a community. Jesus is the shepherd of a flock. He is a, the vine which has many branches. But John uniquely emphasizes the absolute necessity of an ongoing, enduring, living connection between Jesus and each disciple personally. I am the true vine, he says. Abide in me as I abide in you. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. How do we do this? How do we abide in the true vine? We preserve and maintain the connection branch to vine. How do two people stay connected? How do you keep a friend? Regular communication, right? Intentional interaction. Listening carefully and often to the other person. Sharing time and space in each other's presence. Working, serving, side by side. And there is also a group dynamic to staying connected. If Jesus abides in his disciples, 
then we each encounter Jesus anew whenever we gather together in his name, like now. Where even two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, says Jesus, in the midst of them. This is one reason why the repeated practice of gathering together on Sunday as a community is so vital to the life of a church. Another reason to gather together is to recall and reconnect with the words of Jesus, his instruction, his warnings, his consolations, his encouragements, his devotion and promise. Our spirits need to hear Jesus' words again and again to be reminded of who we are and who Jesus is and to connect and to correct our misunderstandings. Hearing the word preached, taught, read, sung, explained, repeated, all of these embed within us the truth so crucial in this present time when we are flooded with falsehoods and m manipulations. Abiding in Jesus is also reinforced by the two ordinances that we observe as Baptists, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is the New Testament practice of immersion in water to symbolize a spiritual rebirth. It's a personal identification with the death and resurrection of Jesus. As one goes under the water, death. As one rises up out of the water, resurrection. Baptism is a public declaration of a personal decision to abide in Jesus going forward into one's life. And typically, baptism is a one-time event, just like being born is a one-time event. The Lord's Supper, though, is a repeated event. It's a practice shared as a community of faith, a symbolic meal of solidarity with other Christian disciples and with Christ, derived from Jesus' Last Supper with the first disciples. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus tells them, the bread symbolizes his body. The cup symbolizes his death on the cross. We consume those at his direction to symbolize how his presence within us energizes us and connects us in an ongoing relationship with him. Said another way, Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches we bear the fruit of God's kingdom only as we stay connected to that true vine who is Jesus. Shall we pray? Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to experience and reconnect with your people, with you. We have been separate for some time trying to make connections in ways that are safe. And finally, we are brought together and we are moving closer together. But in fact, we can still remain connected to you. And we pray that that abiding spirit would continue to be the life force of each of us and of our church congregation. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to hear your word, to be encouraged by the presence and love of others, and to share the fellowship of the Lord's Supper, where once again we remember that we are yours. Be with us, O Lord, as we share this meal of connection together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we'll move into the Lord's Supper and it's a little different, of course, from previous times. But those of you listening or watching, if you want to secure the piece of bread that you have or the cracker, and those of you who have these little containers, you just pull the cellophane off the top, and there's a little disc of cracker. 
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread on the table and he broke it. And he told his disciples, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you bow with me for a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread and for the cup? Gracious Lord, as we hold this wafer in our hands, we think of your son's life and death and resurrection, of his ongoing presence spiritually within us through the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that as we take this bread, we join disciples of many nations and times who also have committed themselves to you and have received your commitment to them. We thank you for the bread and cup that remind us that we abide in you and only in you do we bear the fruit of the disciple. Bless us now as we share this bread in this moment together. In Jesus' name, amen. So would you join me now as we take together the bread of Christ? Afterwards, in the same way, Jesus took the cup on the table, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, and remember me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So I invite you to take the cup that you have, and if you have to open it, do so. And please join with me as we share the cup of Christ together. Gracious Heavenly Father, take us as your disciples out into the world, but connected, always connected, to the vine which is Jesus. Help us to explore ways of maintaining and strengthening that connection and not to fret when pruning happens. Pruning is important as it helps us to bear fruit. Thank you, O oh God, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen. Thank you.